And welcome everybody to TNM Coaching Unplugged and to Zoran Todorovic Interconnected Podcast, the space where you elevate your mind, you deepen your soul connection, you connect to your heart, and you transform and evolve, hopefully, after listening to these recordings. Today, I have a new friend with me. She's a recent friend, but it feels like we knew each other for a long time because our encounter and the connection and resonance between two of us was really palpable the first time when I met her I was in her workshop and I was like my god she is a master <laughs> I was just think, talking to other people about how she was talking about tarot where she was coming from how she was really explaining it I remember driving with three friends of mine which is part of my men's group and we were commenting in the car like she's really really a master so I'm so happy that to invite Marianne Costa to join us today. So what do you need to know about her before we dive into this conversation? First of all, she's multi-creational being of light. This is a given because she's a master. So she's also a professional actress. She is a singer. She's a writer as well, but she's also a tango dancer because she kept on inviting me to come and dance tango with you. I'm so busy. I don't have time to do it. And now she's going to move the country. So I'm never going to be able to dance tango there. But maybe I go to Paris and maybe we dance tango in Paris. We never know. Let's see. She's also a writer. Her recent book is Taro Step by Step. It's still not published in English, but it's published in Spanish and Italian. And very soon it's going to come into English. But if you're listening to us from this region, Spain and Italy, you can get this new book. She has also published, published the book, The Woman's Land, which was a novel a long time ago, but not so long time ago. Then The Way of Tarot with her partner at that time, Yudorovsky. Some of you might know him, some of you might not, but that was a really powerful book. I have it. It's a big book. It's a thick piece. It's a big, big piece of work. I was like, my God, it took them years to write this one. And also the recent metagenealogy as well that can also help you to study the family, the treasures and traps and so on and so forth. So today we're going to explore tarot and how what is marianne's take on tarot we're going to go to different places and hopefully you'll come to this space when you really understand how can you use this in your own life to elevate to enrich to become a better version of yourself so welcome marianne hey such an introduction i'm you you shied me out completely i know i do this to people all the time that's my signature you know it's so funny if you see the previous podcast when i introduce people they're like Oh my God, what am I going to say now? This is too much. But let's kind of go, kind of ease ourselves into it. When we prepped, you told me that tarot is a game. So can we start with that? Why is tarot a game? Absolutely. So the, the conventional games of cards, as we know them, like the poker game, the ancestors of the poker game, came into Europe around 1370. We have record of that. And one century after, someone, and I'm not going into the historical details because Historians are still fighting about this, but someone probably in Italy had the brilliant idea of creating a new suit that has given um, the, the that has given birth to the whole notion of Trump. As you know, when you play in bridge, you have a suit that becomes Trumps. So the first name for it was the Triumphs, and in the Tarot, it was a new suit of twenty-two cards that were some kind of a comprehensive. A description of the human pilgrimage or journey through life in a way that was based in the Christian archetypes. You, you see angels, devils, etc. But that was also very like down to earth with much more like earthly archetypes, like the emperor or like the lovers. And so it, it was an amazing technological invention. It's like, you know, the explosion of video games, but you can think of it in those terms. And the game of Taroki, of it was initially called Le Triomphe, Triomphi, the Triumphs, and then it becomes Tarot or Taroki. Again, let's not go into etymology, but basically it was all the rage in the 16th, 17th, 18th century, and all the way into the 19th century. Wow. So basically, what we're working with is the equivalent of you know, a video game or the Pokemon or something like that, except that it was based in the Renaissance mind. And so it was, it's a game that works as a mandala, a description of the world. Anything else? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's a good introduction how the game came to be. And then slowly, how did this game transform into the personal development 
uh, tool or a, a tool that can help us understand the anatomy of our soul or understand the landscape of our life? How did that happen from your perspective? Yeah, so what we know from history is that from the beginning of the 17th century, there, there, were a lot, there was a lot of creativity around the representation of this game throughout the 16th century. And in the beginning of the 17th, for economical reasons, the, France became the main country to produce tarot. And this tarot, which I have here, which for anyone who knows it a little bit will be familiar, which has known, come to be known as the Tarot de Marseille. It wasn't made in Marseille, but that's another story, became the main standard. So lots of different decks were produced, but with the same uh, format, the same cards, the same numbers, the same drawings, etc. And as the game was losing vogue, like around the French Revolution and throughout the 19th century, something happened in Europe and in France in particular, because that is really a French event where all the masonry started to be very important. In a parallel way, uh, people started doing uh, uh, card reading. It, there was a very, very big trend in the 19th century of people reading anything like, you know, bat dung, coffee leaves, like everywhere. And so people started on the one hand to read the cards, among other things, but like more in a more of like magic and kind of, very um, gross kind of way, like you should do this, you shouldn't do this, like with fortune telling kind of way. And on the other hand, the world of masonry and the more and more growing world of esoteric and occult schools started to become interested in the tarot. The very first person who kind of like put his hands on it as if it was kind of a magic or esoteric game was a mason called Cour de Gébelin. And he was visiting the house of a philosopher, you know, pre-French Revolution. That was all the rage. That was the thing to do at the time. And he was a Swiss guy, not very interesting. And there were a lot of famous people there like Voltaire and Diderot and, you know, the hype people. And so he wanted to make himself interesting. He saw people at the game table and he started to say, oh, this is a, this is a, the, the, the whole story of Egypt. And he started to mytho mythologize the Tarot. And that was the start. And then throughout the 19th century, all the movement of the occult, the magic, uh, the secret societies started to really fall in love with this game. Until, because I think it's important for the English speaking audience, the secret society of the Golden Dawn formed itself around, I'm sorry to disappoint the lovers of the Rider Waite Tarot, but what was a really bad black and white copy of this tarot yeah. And they created the Rider Waite Tarot that was the main tarot in, in the English speaking world for, throughout the, the, the 20th century. So it became this like esoteric object. It's only played in France now. And then there was a second wave in the 20th century where the surrealists started being interested in it as language of the subconscious. And then writers like Italo Calvino started looking at it as a storytelling device. And I am more like plugged into this um, lineage, let's say, because I do work with Tarot as a storytelling device. So when you work with the Tarot as a storytelling device, which I've experienced myself, you know, through certain consultation with you or even the group workshop, how do you approach that unfoldment of the story of one's life by using Tarot? So, you know, it's like with any game, you have to set the rules. So I'm not saying that the way I, look, I read the tarot is the alpha and omega of it. There's so many different ways of interpreting it. But the way I work, I use the four suits, which are the coins, the wands, the cups, mm -hmm. and the swords, as the four energies of the human being. For anyone who is familiar with yoga, it would be like the body or the needs or anamaya kosha in the yoga the sexual creative moving energy or pranamaya kosha in the yoga, the individual emotional energy that can bring us to learn how to love, which would be manomaya kosha in the yoga because it's manas, it's our individual history, and the mental clarity, which is uh, vijnanamaya kosha in the yoga. And so above all that, we have the language of the being, of the essential being, which is this journey of the major arcana. So I look at it as a, complete mandala of the human being. I won't go into the details of the numerology, but basically I have in my mind, and when I teach, a very comprehensive 
vision of the tarot as a mandala of the complete realm of the human experience, whether it is in business or in health or in creative life or in sometimes I even do sexology with individual patients or in psychology or in how to project things, which would be more like life coaching or stuff like that. And I even sometimes answer to people who are really like asking for questions on their spiritual path. Mm -hmm. And we start to have an integral conversation where my idea is that they pick cards from the mandala, from the journey, and they set them on the table. So they can, it's as if they were, they're unconscious. I, I take the bet that the unconscious knows somehow. Yeah. You could go into, you know, Rupert Sheldrake and like uh, form waves. Maybe we know what's in the cart, even if it's turned. Let's not go into that. But let's say there's a beautiful saying that, that says that chance is the name of God when he or she travels incognito. So we take the cards by chance. <laughs> I love that definition. That's such a good definition of chance. <laughs> I should say they travel incognito. It's more, it's more gender fluid, but whatever. Yeah. And so you, you, you take your pick. Mm -hmm. The person who reads for you has to be deeply listening and deeply present. And the person who reads for you has to have some deep knowledge of the tarot because we work as translators, the tarot readers. And then the cards mm -hmm. appear. And in my head, I can connect them. It's like an, in astrology with very intricate constellations of meaning. So it gives me kind of like almost as if it were ideograms or a mathematic formula that is kind of, it's both very precise. Any of my students would basically say the same as the very basic response. And then all the art is to, to let that turn into a poetic story that resonates for the person. And that's where what I would call the feminine or the concave comes into play because of course intuition is working. Of course, resonance is at work. But also, I think in my own case, I operate from a point of view where I want to bet for the possibility of an enlightened solution. It doesn't mean to be all like kumbaya, everything's going to be okay, because I don't believe in that kind of fairy tale, you know, <laughs> way of looking at things. But I keep looking at the way, I mean, the answer can be kind of difficult, but then it becomes initiatic. If the answer is a huge, big yes, go for it, then I wonder why the person is even asking. And we go into why are they shy in front of their luck or talent? So it's, it's a way of, I like to say that it's like when you have a very good producer on a mov movie and you shoot a, a, a series of alternate ending. And then when you edit the movie, you really see what is the right ending for the story. It's opening up the possibility for an alternate ending to the question. Am I making any sense? Absolutely, you're making so much sense. And of course, the you know, timelines are fluid, absolutely. So when somebody engages and chooses the tarot and he or she creates the mandala in front of you and then you get it to the form of art, which is the poetic expression of who they are and what they are and how they can understand it on the level of the soul, absolutely the alternative endings will present themselves because then they would engage, right? They would take responsibility, choice, action. They would do a lot of the things to, to, to translate that reading into their everyday life. Yeah, and it's also, I like to compare it to osteopathy, which means that mm -hmm. the way I look at the tarot, it's like an anatomy of the soul. So if you go to an osteopath, you have a certain anatomy. If you go to a Chinese medicine doctor, you have another. If you have go to someone who works with the chakras, it's yet another anatomy. Tarot is an anatomy in itself. So there is also like kind of with words and with presence, pressing those points in anatomy, seeing what is fluid, what is stuck, and letting the intelligence of life itself, the intelligence of the psyche, the intelligence of what I call the heroic journey of each person kind of fill the gaps. Like if something is stuck, I don't know, there is a conflict and we see in the tarot that this conflict connects back to some conflicts in your brotherhood with your yeah. parents. There was a favorite brother or something. Yeah. We press on that. And the intelligence of life will also allow the person to say, Oh, yes, this coworker I work with, I have the same jealousy or belittling myself that I, that I had with my brother. So either they can already breathe into that and liberate themselves, or maybe we can pick another card 
and see, okay, where are you stuck? Where is the, the hook in not letting go? Because it depends on the depth of the trauma. So that's mm -hmm. the place where, for me, poetry and psychology work together. You can't go all poetical because some wounds are really like biting into, into the flesh of your being, and it will take skillful means to undo. But sometimes poetic justice works by itself. And that's, that's where you get more or less skilled into tarot reading, of course. Yeah, yeah. I love you. It's, 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 it's actually just playing the poetry of the soul and the anatomy of the soul is so beautiful in there. So you also mentioned the heroic journey of, of, of a person. Yeah. Can you expand a little bit more up on that? Because I think it would be really good for us to understand that as well. Yeah. So this is more of a coming out of me as a reader, because I allow my students to read the Tahoe from another perspective, but really through life experience, through whoever I am and whichever reason for which I was born, I started my journey as an avid reader. And I realized mm -hmm. that I always love stories that are stories of growth, which is why most of the literary production contemporary and most of the movie things I don't really like because they don't take us on a quest. So I want to bet for the fact that we are meant to reach, how can I say that, um, the best possible version of ourselves with a really deep learning, even if we have to suffer through it. And I really want to believe that each person has a deep guiding force in a much vaster dimension, call it God, call it a holy mountain, call it spirit guides, call it the, even being in love with truth or beauty. And that I think, I mean, it's really a belief. You can completely disagree with me, but I think that the universe deeply wants enlightenment, beauty, and, and growth from us. So if it's just about me, 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 or even just about the psychology, we can stay stuck in a world that is power driven. And of course, we all have power struggles. Me, the first. I catch myself in power struggle the whole time. But <laughs> the force of surrender to the basic goodness of life. So that is the way in which I think of the hero's journey. I think that trials and errors and even the worst parts of our, ourselves are really meant to connect us, us not only just with ourselves, but to that to whatever it is to which we have to deeply bow. I think the greatest thing that can happen to a human being is actually to fall flat on their face and adore something that is bigger than us. I'm going, I'm going to be maybe out of, out of line for most of the uh, contemporary spirituality, which is very much about, oh, I am the goddess. No, I am flat on my face before the goddess, which is a different thing, you know? So I love the idea that the tarot is the messenger for, from that dimension. And that it can, talk to, it can talk to us in ways that are sometimes very cruel or very confusing, but that in the end, it's about surrendering to something that can seem to be such an ordeal and that wants our greater good. Does that sound very Catholic? Absolutely. And you, you know, in the coaching perspective, because it's a coaching show as well, we come from the same dimension, but right? we believe that whatever obstacle, challenge, opportunity in your life presents itself to you, you have everything inside of you to be able to transform this in your own life. So, and there is a bigger goodness behind that challenge that is teaching you something, right? So it's a learning opportunity. Even if you're struggling, as you said, you fell down in the face and you need to bow and you need to let go, you need to release. The intent, it's your own personal growth and evolution. And if you go through that trial, through the hero's journey, and you learn whatever you need to learn from those lessons, you will then be able to evolve to the next version of yourself. So it's the same entry point. And I think this is super important. And it's super important not to kind of pushing it around to something fluffy. Sometimes life is challenging. Oh, yeah. Simple as that. Sometimes life is challenging. And, you know, isn't it? It's not always like, yeah, 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 this is good and nice. We have to go through certain initiations and passages and rite of passages of our soul in order for us to be able to become a better version of ourselves. Correct? Yeah, absolutely. There's another aspect of the Tahoe that I really like, and it's, it's kind of binary, but it's not, is mm -hmm. that the first and the last card, there mm -hmm. are this like, you know, traveler that doesn't have a number and this literally it's a naked woman dancing. I've always mm -hmm. seen them as the force of the sperm being called by the ovum. So it's an inseminating force. And 
the tarot being an object of the Renaissance, we have to see that Renaissance comes from the courteous love and this context in which the lady and the king or the lord were married for social reasons. But there was this third element, which was the knight. And so there was the initiatic love that most of the time was a chaste love. But there was this other version of love that supposed sometimes uh, frustration, chastity, and things like that, so that we were both acting out of love in the real realm and as Renaissance was, you know, transmitting the land to, in the patriarchal way to the heirs, etc. But that there was another aspect of love, which was the chosen aspect. So Tahoe is organized in couples. And it's organized very clearly as a journey from this love, which is complicated, of course, in current spirituality, it would be the wonderful Tantra, polyamorous, blah, 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 blah. But here, it's kind of a necessary evil, the law of attraction, with yeah. a very, very young angel, childish angel, actually, into this quality, which is animus and anima, inside and out, Ardhana Reshvar, if, if we think in terms of the dual deities, and producing consciousness under the guidance of a mature angel. So it's very important because this is what brings us back to psychology, to mom and dad. And this is also the place where the tarot can be very tender and also welcome us in moments when we freak out, when we feel that we're the worst version of ourselves, when we don't know what to hang on to. And that's the moment when the heroic journey turns into what I call a healing fiction, which is that I've, I've created a little revolution in the tarot. Normally you mix the cards, you put them face down and you take what faith gives you. That was the first part of our story. Yeah, right. When it's really too hard and the reading seems stuck, I tell the person, take the cards and pick the one you need. Pick the one you like. Oh, there's a woman with a lion. She's going to help me. I have to move out from Ibiza right now. I need this strength. So it's also the idea to have a repertoire of allies. It's not just to find it in myself. It's to see that if we cry for help and if we allow ourselves to choose help, it's going to come. And we can even break the rules and, you know, choose cards on site. So that's kind of another level. Wow. But, you know, in the last year and a half with the pandemic and stuff, I've been witnessing so much um, agony and, and people in really dire situations that I've tend to develop this kind of, of work because it feels like it's, it's really needed right now. I don't know how that resonates for you. Maybe it's... I, of course, you know, I think that the gentle part of it is super important. And, you know, right now the collective consciousness is going through the huge hero's journey in itself, right? If you were to go from the individualization of looking into from the lens of individual self into collective self, we're all in this together. And I agree, you know, even though we're getting initiated, sometimes the gentleness is necessary to support the love, you know? And I, I'm with you. When you open up for that support, and you really seek it, then it comes to you. And I love breaking the rules because rules are made to be broken. I mean, somebody somewhere decided that all the tarot cards needs to be done, that there is a hand of God that you need to pull with the hand of God right now and see it and not know it. That was a rule at that given moment in time. Why, why not evolve it to it's the next level of itself? Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. You can change the rules. Yeah. 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 What I love about this is because every time I had a tarot reading in the past and with you, it really gave me such a beautiful objective mirroring to where I am it was like mirroring was impeccable and this is for me like I always even now I know the power of it I'm always like surprised how did the cards know that I mean it's just ridiculous to me how did the cards knew to mirror this back to me right I'm asking yeah, myself so, the same question and I still don't have an answer yeah and I think and, that's the reason why I keep going it's like a you know a long-term marriage if there is still like this dimension of complete mystery in the other you stay in love yes it it drives you yeah yeah i love that if there is a complete mystery in others it drives you so that's one and the other one that is always wonderful for me is the guidance mm -hmm. so mirroring was there but then if i was stuck confused in agony you know like we all are going through things right now due to this crisis there was a guidance there and sometimes guidance was guidance was really gentle and really like just do this adjustment and everything will fall into the place. 
And sometimes the guidance was like, okay, now you really need to work on this. I mean, you, 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 you can't you know, ignore this any longer. Now you have to go through this, no matter what you think, no matter what resistance you have, you need to go through this as well. And sometimes guidance was something that I never thought about, that was completely out of my conscious, even subconscious mind, and it just came like, woof, consider this. So I know that the power and how it impacts other people, it's absolutely amazing, yeah. One of the things I really like with the tarot is that it has 78 cards. Most of the people just work with the trumps. But mm -hmm. one of the things I really like is to work with the court cards. They don't, the court cards, the fit cards, they don't look like anything. But if, mm -hmm. you, if you know how to read them, they will give you very specific input as to change something in your thinking, observe something in your heart, do something with your creativity, change something in your life habits. And so I love to add those little, very detailed cards, because sometimes we go into the big concept. Oh, change, revolution, whatever, surrender. And then, you know, you're here with your, like, going to buy the food. You have your, your packs of food and you need to, you know, to go pick up the kids from school. And you're like, yeah, okay, but how do I do this right now? And that's what I love about the pip cards. They're so specific. And they, and they have the same power of guidance, which is very well known in the major arcana. Yeah, 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 I've experienced that. I remember in our conversations, it was one or two cards, just do this, don't do that. And it really changed my life, honestly. It was small. Oh. This is what I was talking about, small adjustments. And I remember all the time, it was one of the cards that told me, you're going to be hooked onto this. Don't get hooked and pulled into this situation because it's a pattern that keeps on repeating in your life and you keep on being pulled into it. So right with that card, I was so mindful to recognize it when it was coming my way. I was like, oh my God, this is here, it comes again. Okay, oh, I got you, not right now. So how do I act in order to be able not to be hooked onto the same pattern? So the power, it's amazing. And what I love about your explanation of Tarot is that you make it so scientific and artistic, you know, yeah. because we even open the conversation that people have certain judgments around Tarot. You know, when I mentioned to people, oh my God, Tarot, they're like, oh my God, there is a stigma and judgment. But when you talk about it, you, such, you have such a power and integrity. For me, this is science and art and, and the beautiful language that you use, anatomy of soul, right? Yeah, it is. You know, the Tarot itself is based in Pythagorean numerology. It's based in the whole philosophy of the Renaissance. It, it is based in uh, the iconography, the religious iconography of the time. So it does have ground. It's just that most people, I mean, I come from comparative literature, studying history. So it's, it's kind of my, my field, but most people, they go to it because they feel drawn to it. But I, I sorry, I almost interrupted you, but I said, can I show you my new baby? Because the step, yeah. the next step is that, okay, Tarot of Marseille is a holy structure, but what about oracles? So the thing I did recently, and you also experienced it, is that I took the Mexican bingo that has like, you know, a watermelon, a tree, <laughs> a woman on a on a little like uh, boat, a guy with a knife. So something that is completely like popular literature, et cetera. And I started thinking, okay, if everything can be initiatic, if I'm true to my belief that the hero's journey is everywhere, how can I work with the Mexican bingo? So my passion right now is to do a very tarot, like holy, like you say, scientific, psychological, the stuff I've been doing for the last 20 years. Then I'm like, you know, it has also a little devil. I think it's the, de the little devil of the Mexican bingo that inspired me. And I'm like, okay, so now let's try to see what the Mexican bingo has to say about it. And I was flabbergasted. Here's the little devil. I just love him. El Diablito. And I was flabbergasted because picking those things, those cards that have no, what well, some of the cards are like the tarot, because if I go into the history, those bingos date back from the 1650s, and they were actually connected with the same iconography, but it's much yeah. more whimsical. But mm -hmm. I realized that anything works. You can work with your children's books, like, you know, like you, the characters of your children's books. You can work with your own heroes of childhood. You can work with a pantheon, even, not, even though you're not from that religion, like the Hindu pantheon, the Orishas pantheon. If you start considering a whole of images, whatever it is, as a potentially initiatic response, I think the universe is trying to, or God or whatever, is trying to talk to us in every possible way. So I kind of wanted to put the Mexican bingo in the midst of it because I'm so in love with it right I now. Know. I'm sorry, I kind of 
impressed it onto you, but but it's and it's also fun, you know. What what, what Mexican bingo brings its element of fun, you know, because you buy it up. This that one, fun. yeah. yeah. Through this one, the dancing and happy guy, you know, El Negrito. Yeah. He was actually a poet in the 18th century uh, Mexico. So it's very important because it's not just about studying the Tao. It's about being able to, and that's a very shamanic, I mean, shamanic, not in the sense of medicine, but in the sense more of um, contemplation shamanism, which is more my, 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 my line in shamanism. It's being able to welcome any image that comes to me specifically as a vision quest, as the, as the result of a vision quest, and receive the image, the tree, the sound of the, of the bell ringing image or, or event, uh, the eagle flying, or just, you know, the ant crawling in the, in, in, the, in, in the grass as, wow, this is the message right now. And, that, and I've really learned that from Tahoe, oddly enough because Tao develops the capacity to see. It's also a vision quest. Yeah, it expands your ways of seeing. So we're coming closer towards the, the end of our conversation. So we always love to ask our guests and teachers to give something that people might start practicing, you know, as a result of listening to this. What would you like to challenge us to do or share yeah. with us? Yeah, well, I think exactly because I think not everybody who's listening has a Tao game. So... Yeah. What I would like to give you is an exercise in what I call healing fictions. Mm -hmm. And it's very simple. You sit quietly. You, you go through the four suits of the tarot, which means you go into your physical sensation, the soles of your feet, and kind of acknowledge that it's there. Then you dare to go into the sensation of your genital area, which is also your center of gravity. And you acknowledge the living energy in there, whatever it is right now. Then you go into your heart and it might be pure or completely obscured with emotions. And you welcome the color of your heart as it is. And then you go into the center of your skull, the pineal gland. And you see if you can find a place where you can lay an egg in which the word yes is written, wherever that is, an egg of thinking that is pure yes. And from this place, you let a question or a slight difficulty, something that, you, that is slightly challenging you, arise from your body into your consciousness and let it come from the body as much as you can. And just welcome it. Little sense of something that could maybe be easier. And you can sit it in front of you as if it were a friend coming to ask for help. And if you are an expert of the Taho, you can choose an archetype of the Taho and have it descend between the two of you. But if you don't know the Taho, choose any image that feels good, a hero of your childhood, an image of a god or a goddess, an image of something in the landscape that has, but it has to have a very clear definition. And just let this archetype descend as if it was the bonding quality between you as you are right now and that thing that came up and that has difficulty. And instead of just being in your seat or in the seat where the problem is, allow yourself to move your consciousness into the archetype and let it quietly, if you're more visually oriented, either morph into something visual or if you're more of a, someone that, has, um, that receives messages, let it speak to you. And whatever comes up, just let it flow. And the only thing I will ask you is to write down what the, after it's done, what the difficulty was, 
which archetype came and what was either the message or the morphing into. It's a bit quick, but it works. And that's exactly what we need sometimes. We need something quick that works to help us out through this wonderful- I had a, a fish on a hook that turned into a mermaid. <laughs> that's wonderful. Very happy with mine. <laughs> I had the fool upside down that turns into joy. <laughs> yes, exactly. But and then what happens with images is that you it's really good to kind of feed them, let them live during throughout the day. But maybe just put a little post-it or something if you do this kind of work, either with the tarot or with other images. For instance, if you if you pick a card in the morning as an ally, just remember to bring your attention back to it. When we activate the visual cortex in the brain, we activate the right brain size. I'm not, I didn't go into neurology this time, but it, there's also a whole ground of neurology behind it. So it's a way to go into right brain, but that you can do as you drive. You can't go into meditation as you drive, or you can go, can't go into very deep bodily feeling, for instance. But you can have an image dancing in, at the bottom of your, of your consciousness. And it really feeds the space in very uncanny ways cool thank you so much for coming today it was such a pleasure and joy to to share with you and to exchange you know the learning and the teaching thank you so much people for tuning in for listening to tnm unplugged and zoran todorovich interconnected so lovely to have this amazing traveling poet the teacher with us today marianne costa if you want to know more about her you go to mariancosta.com website or to the social media i think instagram is the best place and also facebook you can find more information about her download books buy books i don't know if you're ever open for private consultation but maybe that will happen if people really want to i know you're not easy <laughs> to open I have a home in Ibiza. <laughs> thank you so much for coming have a wonderful day thank you everybody for listening bye for now Thank you.